Hello everyone, I just wanted to um, make a video and it's really going to be about this PCR testing which essentially is what we're all being held hostage to host what we're all being held hostage to and so I'm going to start off with a video from the DNA Learning Center which explains what PCR Using testing is. Using transcription polymerase chain reaction RT-PCR in COVID-19 testing. COVID-19 testing usually begins with a swab of the nose or throat. Saliva, mucus, or fluid from a patient's lungs can also be used. The swab of a person with COVID-19 will contain a mixture of human cells, virus particles, and other microbes. Like all living things, the human cell has DNA as the genetic material that passes on information from one generation to the next. The DNA molecule is made up of two strands that look like a twisted ladder or double helix. However, the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, and many other viruses, including HIV, have RNA as their genetic material, genome. RNA is chemically very similar to DNA, but has only a single strand. The virus RNA is surrounded by a nucleocapsid protein within the virus envelope. Other proteins are embedded in the envelope itself. The SARS-CoV-2 genome contains genes, blue arrows, that carry the directions for making these and other proteins that are needed to replicate the virus inside the human cell. The objective of COVID-19 testing is to identify part of the viral genome in the patient sample. This is usually the end gene which carries directions for making the nucleocapsid protein. There is not enough viral RNA to detect directly in the patient's sample, so a process called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, amplifies many copies of a segment of the end gene. Short, single-stranded pieces of DNA called primers recognize unique RNA sequences within the viral genome that bracket the target region of the end gene. After the first primer binds, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase extends, synthesizes, a single-stranded DNA copy of the viral RNA, known as complementary DNA, or cDNA. After the RNA is removed, the second primer binds to the other side of the single-stranded cDNA. Then, a second enzyme, TAC-DNA polymerase, extends a second strand to produce the double-stranded DNA copy of the target region of the viral RNA. This DNA copy then undergoes successive rounds, cycles of amplification, during which the DNA separates, denatures into single strands, both primers bind, anneal, to their target sequences, TAC polymerase extends, synthesizes a new DNA strand, and so on. The number of copies of the target region of the viral genome doubles with each cycle. After 30 cycles, up to a billion DNA copies of the viral RNA are produced by PCR. In practice, the virus is typically detected with 30 to 45 cycles of PCR. Adding a fluorescent probe allows the amount of target DNA to be detected in real time and quantified after each cycle of PCR. This graph shows the detection of 200, 20, and only two virus RNA molecules in a controlled study. Results from swabs vary. A negative result is also shown. See these DNA Learning Center animations for a more detailed look at the PCR process. So there you have an authoritative source of how this test works, and you can see, for example, that they vary the number of cycles, which is essentially, I think, a time period over which this test is run to produce this result and as you may have heard it produces a lot of false positives. Now there's a video which was posted recently by uh, Spyro Skouras who runs the uh, Activist Post website and I was very interested in this clip of uh, Carrie Mullis who is the inventor of this technique which you just saw the video about and Carrie Mullis he actually was doing AIDS research in the early 90s and late 80s and he actually as you can see here won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1993 along with Michael Smith and it was awarded for the polymerase chain reaction 
technique that they developed. So I'm just going to play a little clip of him talking about this technique, which is now being used, you know, all across the world to supposedly judge uh, what risk we're at. So here's here's a clip of him talking about that. It's not an estimation. No, it's a real. It's a really quantitative thing. It How tells you it? something about nature and about what's there, but it. It, it allows you to take a very minuscule amount of anything and make it measurable and then talk about it in meetings and stuff like it is important. See, that, that, that's not a misuse, that's just sort of a misinterpretation. It, it is. No, they, that, th th there's very little of what they call HIV and what's been brought out here by Phil Pott and, and, and Isai already. It, it, the measurement for it is not, is not exact at all. It's not, it's not as good as our measurement for things like apples. An apple is an apple. You know, you can get something that's kind of like, if you've got enough things that look kind of like an apple and you stick them all together, you might think of it as an apple. But, and, the, and HIV is like that. Those tests are all based on things that are invisible and they are, the results are inferred in a sense. PCR is separate from that. It's just a process that's used to make a whole lot of something out of something. That's what also, it is. Um, it's, but it's not, it doesn't tell you that you're sick and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. That's why it's not. So even if you. And they are, the results are inferred in a sense. PCR is separate from that. It's just a process that's used to make a whole lot of something out of something. That's what also, it is. Um, but, it's, the, but it's not, it doesn't tell you that you're sick and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. That's why it's not. So even if you believe in HIV, it can't tell the difference between virus particles or active live virus. I mean, there's a lot of questions. I was sent this document, uh, and I'll go to the front, and you can see it's instructions for use for the RealStar SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR kit 1.0, and then this is from 03, I'm assume, assuming that's March 2020, which is about the right time frame. So they scroll down this document, and oh, look at that, it says for research use only, let's scroll down a bit. So the real star SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR kit 1.0 is a reagent system based on real-time PCR technology for qualitative detection and differentiation of lineage beta coronavirus and severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. SARS-CoV-2 specific RNA. And it says again, for research use, not for use in diagnostic procedures. And we can see this word qualitative which means that what it will do is detect this, what it claims to detect, allegedly it will detect this, but it won't tell you how much there is. It will only tell you if there is a sample there or not, which this, a single sample can be amplified. It doesn't give you any actual diagnosis. It doesn't tell you how infectious you are or anything like that. It doesn't tell you, it just tells you whether this RNA sequence or one of several is present in the sample. That's all it does. And as Carrie Mullis says, it doesn't tell you if you, you've got sick from this. It doesn't tell you if you will be sick from this. It doesn't tell you that at all. Now, I have to wonder because uh, a few couple of months ago, I actually sent a Freedom of Information request to Public Health England asking for the names of companies that have produced the SARS-CoV-2 testing kits in England and or the UK and copies of the instructions and or guidelines included with one of more of these, preferably all of these testing kits that I use in the UK and any labelling or recommendations that accompany the kits. Copies of pages which show what uh, or how the results of these tests are interpreted. I made a couple of typos on here, unfortunately. But So anyway, I sent this to Public Health England. They said, no, we, we can't tell you. Uh, so please write to the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, which is what I sent this to. They wrote back to me and basically said um, prohibitions on disclosure. They quoted that and the reason for that prohibition was information provided to the MRHRA in the course of its functions under the medical devices directives is required to be treated as confidential according to the confidentiality provisions in Article 19 of Directive 98-79-EC on in vitro, that means in a test tube or in, a, or in glass diagnostic medical devices. Disclosure of the information you have requested would breach that obligation. And that's despite the fact that we've got this document from one such testing kit freely available. So what does that tell you? Well, 
So what is this RT-PCR being used to judge? Well, it is being used to judge whether there should be things like local lockdowns, for example, in Nottingham, which is a big city near where I live. And then it says here, for example, a total of 399 new cases have been reported in the country in the last 24 hours. Well, that might be because there's maybe 500 tests have been done in the last 24 hours. And when you do these PCR tests and they give a positive result, which doesn't mean anybody is sick, it doesn't mean anybody has died, it doesn't mean anybody is going to die. That figure is always going to go up. They're always going to get new cases because they're doing more tests. And how do they get more and more tests done? Well, how about this, for example? In the UK, we have the Office for National Statistics and Oxford University, right? They have been sending out letters, and I got a copy of one of these letters from a chap called Peter Woodhead, and uh, I, 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 he t actually tore up his letter, though he sent me a picture, and I've got a picture of a, an exactly the same letter, all right, here, and this is on Wikispooks, you, you'll find all the links in the description here. And they're basically saying that uh, you'll, you'll get a visit once a week from a study worker to collect a nose and throat swab, and this will happen for four weeks in a row, so five visits in total, a visit once a month after this for 12 months in a row to collect a nose and throat swab. As a thank you, anyone in your household who takes part will receive a voucher for each visit, £50 for the first visit, £25 for each further, first visit. So you're looking, if they're doing this across the country, millions of pounds. You know, hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds are being put into this, obviously, because not only have they got to pay off people for this testing, they're going to be having to pay their workers, they're having to pay laboratories. This is multi-millions of pounds in the UK on this. And I can only conclude that the only reason for doing this is to get these numbers up so they can claim that there are these cases. Now, you can see that the letter is signed by Ian Bell who's the Director General of the ONS. Now, I did a little look-up on him, and here he is. Here's this fellow, and uh, it appears that a senior civil servant has caused a storm by claiming that systemic racism exists in Britain and endorsing the Black Lives Matter movement in an email to hundreds of staff. So, he's endorsing the Black Lives Matter. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Same guy who's on this PCR testing letter. Isn't that interesting? So how else are they going to get the numbers of positive results up? Well, how about getting the army involved, like they're doing in Birmingham in the UK? And I've just received reports that they're now doing this. This report was on the 25th of September, and now I haven't got the video clip. Um, and uh, they're actually getting the army going uh, round to people's houses. And, for example, we've got this. What is the army doing swabbing people? What is this guy? Th what does he think he's doing? What is he doing? We know what he's doing. He's helping to make a future job for himself by helping to bring in, as they put it here, medical martial law. This is what it looks like we're heading towards. So be wary of this, folks. Understand what the PCR test is and does. I've tried to show you in this video a bit about it. And thankfully, there are some people... Uh, who do seem to understand this because I'm, I'm not sure what this meeting is from. We've got this guy called Dave Sims. This was sent to me by uh, an immunologist and um, she points out that this guy is clued in to what's going on with the testing. I think it's a school board meeting in the US somewhere. I, I can't see any other details than this but uh, have a listen to this for a minute. The PCR test but the inventor of the test himself, Kerry Mullis, a Nobel Prize winning biochemist, said never ever use this test to test for infectious disease because that's not what the test is designed for. So what's going on right now is we're getting very flawed numbers and we're getting very, numbers that are very, very, very skewed right now. So what's going on here and even the death rate right now, the numbers that I gave, that came from the CDC and, and the amount of deaths, even doctors, many doctors, including uh, my personal doctor, my personal physician said that what's going on here right now is wrong and there's, there's a, a, an agenda behind this and doctors themselves are saying, this is not the right test, and, and, and they're getting paid lots of money to label people as COVID when they are not COVID. And so if you look at the overall death rates of 2020 in comparison to 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016, we don't have a higher death rate. 
It's because what's going on right now, people that are dying from the flu, from the regular flu, or they're dying from pneumonia, or a million other things are being labeled as COVID. Right. And this is part of the problem. George Floyd, the George Floyd, who, who we all know about, was labeled as COVID. Dave, thank okay? you very much. I, I, I think your yeah. time is up. You're not. You're not. But, but, yeah. Okay. Dave, thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate it. So at least there are one or two people now who understand what I've been showing you. So really that's what I wanted to include in this video. And again, please uh, do your own research. But for now, I'll say goodbye.